Hello, my name is Dr. Selva. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at Makuta Medical Center, Malacca. Firstly, I would like to thank MSAD for inviting me to give this lecture. My lecture is entitled, How Haifu Can Help Infertile Patients with Adenomyosis. Now, this is my disclosure. I run an ultrasound-based Haifu Center at Makuta Medical Center, Malacca. Now, when I look at ultrasound, how do we define adenomyosis? Basically, there are two types of adenomyosis. The first is diffuse adenomyosis, and the second is focal adenomyosis or adenomyoma. And this is very well illustrated in this book called Adenomyosis. However, there is a paper that was published in 2015, and they actually classified adenomyosis by ultrasound into eight different types. The one that we all are familiar with is this type in which one part of the uterus wall is more thicker than the other. This is what we call as asymmetrical thickening. However, there are other types. For example, cysts in the myometrium, uh, echoic islands in the myometrium. There are fan-shaped lesions in the myometrium. There are also echogenic subendometrial lines, translational vascularity. There are irregular junctional zones and also interrupted junctional zone. These are not very easily seen by ultrasound. We are, most of the time, we are only familiar with these three types where there's asymmetrical thickening and also sometimes cysts and leaks in the adenomyosis. Now, this is an example of an adenomyotic uterus done by abdominal ultrasound. The anterior wall is very thin. That is 1.266 centimeters. This is a normal uh, wall, whereas the posterior is very much thickened at 5.972 centimeters. This is a transvaginal ultrasound showing similarly an anterior wall that is 1.2 centimeters and a posterior wall is about 2 centimeters, indicating that this is most probably an adenomyosis. Other lesions are focal lesions like this. This is, this is an, a lesion here in the posterior wall of the uterus at the fundus measuring 2 by 2.8 uh, centimeter. And this is an adenomyoma. This patient has salmirina in the uterus. Now, what is a normal thickness of a myometrium? In this study entitled Myometrial Wall Thickness Ratio, a Nomogram Reference for Diagnosing Myometrial Wall Symmetry, they came to a conclusion that the normal thickness of a myometrium is, can be as low as 0.64 centimeters to as high as 1.45 centimeters. So if anything that is more than 1.45 centimeters, it can be considered as thickened. Now, when we look at MRI, the situation is slightly different. We can uh, define it by either diffuse adenomyosis, internal adenomyosis, external adenomyosis, or adenomyoma. And here is the diagrammatic representation of the MRI classification of adenomyosis as published in this paper. Number A to number E are what we call as internal adenomyosis. This, this means that adenomyosis actually starts internally and then goes outwards. It depends on how much of the junctional zone that is affected. If there is globular involvement, then this is more of a diffuse adenomyosis. The second type is the what we call as the adenomyoma. There are different types of adenomyoma depending on where it is. It could be a submucous adenomyoma or subserous adenomyoma or intramural adenomyoma. The third type is what we call as an external adenomyosis. Here, the adenomyosis starts outside and comes in. It starts at the subserosal layer, and then it comes in. If it is posterior, then we call it a posterior external adenomyoma. If it is anterior, then we call it anterior external adenomyoma. Now, when we look at adenomyosis, they are basically, it can be located either anteriorly, posteriorly, or globular, globularly, what we call as globular adenomyosis. Now, I can give you some example this is an anterior adenomyosis where the adenomyosis is found in the anterior wall of the uterus. And here you can see it on this MRI video that this is an anterior adenomyosis. The second is a posterior adenomyosis, the most common type of adenomyosis where the adenomyosis is in the posterior wall. Here you can see that this adenomyosis is in the posterior wall of the uterus. The third one is the diffuse adenomyosis where the adenomyosis is found all over. It is found anterior fundus and posterior, and this is what we call as a diffuse adenomyosis. So when I look at the types of adenomyosis, there are different types of adenomyosis. The first is the smooth adenomyosis. The second are cysts in the adenomyosis called cystic adenomyosis. Then we have lakes in the adenomyosis, and also 
we have got a pedunculated adenomyosis. And let me show you all this one by one. This is the smooth adenomyosis. These are adenomyosis that are actually found very smooth in the posterior wall. And in my experience, these are the ones that are very easy to do HIFU. The second is the cystic adenomyosis. Here you can see little, little cyst in the adenomyosis. This adenomyosis can be a bit more difficult to ablate because they are long-standing adenomyosis. The third are the ones with huge cystic lesion or lakes in the adenomyosis. These are the adenomyosis that are much more difficult to do because these are all bleeding in the adenomyosis and this can be very difficult to ablate. And then we have the pedunculated adenomyosis where you have a lesion that's coming out of the uterus and these are pedunculated adenomyosis. So what are the principles of HIFU ablation? In the principles of HIFU ablation, there are differences between ablating fibroids and adenomyosis. Now, if you look at a fibroid, a fibroid is a well-circumscribed lesion with a capsule. And this is a contrast MRI. And because they are well-circumscribed with a capsule, it is easy to ablate them. And you can contain the energy within the capsule and ablate the adenomyosis. And here you can see both the, both the fibroids have been ablated. This is not the same if you look at an adenomyosis. Adenomyosis, the lesion is all over the place. It's usually up to the serosa and can be anterior and posterior. So ablating an adenomyosis is far more difficult than ablating a fibroid because we need to give a, a margin of safety at the serosa layer and also must be, we must be able to avoid the endometrium when we are ablating adenomyosis. So ablating adenomyosis is far more difficult than ablating a fibroid. There is a difference in performing HIFU for patients who want to conceive and who are not keen to conceive. In patients who do not want to conceive, extensive ablation can be performed and this can even include the endometrial cavity. The success rate of reducing symptoms is higher in this case because we can do extensive ablation, we can kill more adenomyosis and so the chances of recurrence of the disease is lesser if the patient does not want to conceive. In patients who want to conceive, ablation will need to be done more carefully to avoid ablating the endometrium. In these cases, the ablation will be limited and the success in reducing symptoms will be lesser as less energy will be given to the adenomyotic area. So this is very important when we are doing ablation for adenomyosis. So what are the challenges in ablating adenomyosis? Not all adenomyosis cases are the same. I showed you that they are smooth adenomyosis, they are cystic adenomyosis, they come, sometimes there are lakes in adenomyosis and each type of adenomyosis, the ablation can differ. In some cases, there may be a gap between the adenomyosis and the endometrial cavity. In these cases, the chances of reaching the endometrial cavity is lesser. However, in others, the adenomyosis reaches the endometrial cavity and breaching the transformation zone. Here, it is very easy to reach the endometrial cavity. The energy given must be low and controlled. And sometimes I wonder if the endometrium has already been involved by the adenomyosis, whether reaching the endometrium will be beneficial as most probably new endometrium will grow over the ablated endometrium. So for example, this patient has got adenomyosis that is actually bulging into the endometrial cavity and it's difficult to avoid ablating. And when I ablated, I actually reached the endometrial cavity. So these are the challenges when ablating adenomyosis. Other types of adenomyosis are adenomyosis not involving the junctional zone, adenomyosis involving the junctional zone, as I showed earlier, and also adenomyosis adherent to the bowel posteriorly. So when the adenomyosis is not involving the junctional zone, like this case, where the adenomyosis, there is a gap between the ad ad adenomyotic lesion and the endometrium, it is actually easier to do the, leash, the ablation. And you can see that here, the ablation is done very nicely and it did not reach the endometrial cavity because the endometriosis did not reach the endometrial cavity. As opposed to a patient where the adenomyosis has reached the junctional zone, this is an example of a patient with an adenomyosis that's already involved the, uh, uh, the junctional zone. Here you can see in this video that the adenomyosis has already penetrated into the junctional zone. So when we ablate in this kind of patients, there is a very high chance that it will reach the endometrial cavity and the endometrium at the junctional zone will be affected. And this is an example. After three months, you can see that the, the adenomyosis has involved the junctional zone. And here I'm doing a uh, hysteroscopy on this patient whom I have ablated up to the junctional zone. And you can see that the posterior wall has been affected by the ablation. You can see it here. So these are some of the challenges in patients who want to get pregnant. If the endometrium is already involved 
by the adenomyosis, when we do ablation, it's going to affect and we have to wait until all these necrotic tissues has come out before the patient can attempt to get pregnant or we do an embryo transfer. Another type is other adenomyosis in which the bowel is adherent posterior. Here we have to be careful so that we do not ablate the bowel accidentally. So this is my experience. I started performing Haifu in, say, in July 2021 and up to August uh, this year, I've done 461 cases out of which 282 are fibroids and 179 are adenomyosis. Now this is the Haifu Center at Makuta Medical Center. It is a small room where the machine is placed. I'm using a JC200 machine, which is a smaller machine. And, and, and this is where we perform all, all our Haifu at Makuta Medical Center. So in this lecture, I'm just going to concentrate on patients who want to get pregnant. Now, when we look at adenomyosis patients requiring Haifu, there are different types of patients. The first patient are the ones who are not keen to get pregnant. And these are the patients that I like. It's easy to perform Haifu for this patient. And then there's a group who are keen to get pregnant. In the group that's who are keen to get pregnant, there's one group of patients who already have high VF and have the NF frozen embryo. Then there are patients who are single and also patients who would want to get pregnant spontaneously. And then of course, there is a group of patients who are unsure whether they want to conceive. These are the group of patients that I'm not really happy about. Now I am going to talk about only those groups who are keen to get pregnant. And the first group I'll talk about is the patients who have a frozen embryo. Now, these are very good patients. I'll give you an example of a patient. The, in this kind of patient, the ablation needs to be done carefully to prevent involvement of the endometrium. Then I'll give them GnRH analog for three months. And this is followed by embryo transfer. And I plan the embryo transfer three months after the HIFU, irrespective of the patient, whether she has got menses or not. And this is probably the time when the uterus is at, at its smallest and this will be a best time uh, to do the embryo transfer. I'll give you an example. This is Madam CLF, a 35-year-old lady married for five years with no children. In 2019, she underwent IVF with two frozen embryos. She was given GnRH analog depot at that time. She also underwent a, a laparoscopy in 2020. She was given GnRH analog another two doses, monthly two doses after that. And one embryo was transferred in June 2021. Unfortunately, she did not conceive. She suffers from severe dysmenorrhea and heavy menses, and she was on transanemic acid to control the bleeding. When, when she was referred to me for HIFU, an examination showed that the uterus was 16 weeks size. Ultrasound showed a large posterior adenomyosis size was 9.63 times 10.84 times 8.56 centimeters. And this is how the adenomyosis looked. It was a large adenomyosis on one side, on the right side of the uterus. And this is a transverse view showing that the adenomyosis was involving the endometrial cavity on the right side of the uterus. So she underwent HIFU in September 2021, and these were the energies that were given. A total of 146 minutes of treatment were given. 1,635 seconds of treatment was given. We didn't do an MRI immediately after the HIFU, and we did the MRI three months later. This is how the MRI looked. The whole adenomyotic lesion was ablated, and this here, it also shows that the ablation of the adenomyosis. And this is the transverse view, and you can see that the adenomyosis, which is on the right side, has been completely ablated. And this is the volume of the uterus from the time she saw me up to the time 10 months later. At the beginning, of the volume of the uterus was 940 centimeter cubed. The normal volume of a uterus is about 60 to 80 centimeter cubed. So this is about to 10 to 12 times larger than the normal uterus. And this is after one month of treatment, it was 448. And then after three months was 318. And after about six months, it was 265 centimeter cubed. So the volume reduction was about 71.8 after about six months. I sent her back to an IVF specialist for frozen embryo transfer. The IVF specialist repeated the CA125 and found that it was still high. And so she gave her another dose of GnRH analog and the CA125 reduced to 20.7. She then did a frozen embryo transfer without inducing any bleeding. She just gave the patient progynova two milligrams three times a day for 11 days and then added eutrogestin and then did the frozen embryo transfer on the 25th of June, 2022. The patient conceived and delivered a baby in February this year by caesarean section. This is uh, 
patient with the baby and she allowed me to use these photographs. So far, we have already have five patients in this category. These are all patients who have failed IVF. Uh, uh, they have had frozen embryo transfer and failed IVF. They're sent to me for HIFU. And after HIFU, I send them back to their respective uh, IVF specialists. And then they did a frozen embryo transfer. And five of them have got pregnant. Out of them, actually, four have already delivered. One is still ongoing. So then the problem of HIFU patients who have frozen embryo transfer site, when is the best time to do the frozen embryo transfer? Uh, I am giving GNRH and lock for three months after HIFU for my patients with adenomyosis. In my limited experience, the shrinkage of adenomyosis after HIFU at, at three months is the maximum. And this may be the best time to perform the frozen embryo transfer. So after that, the uterus will expand due to the weaning effect of GNRH and lock. So spontaneous men menses usually occurs around six months after the generation of lock. So currently I'm advising frozen embryo transfer at three months post HIFU, even before the return of menstruation. Next, let's look at the patients who are keen to have spontaneous pregnancy. So in this patient, I still have to do a careful ablation without involvement of the endometrium. I give them generation and lock for three months. And then if they are unable to conceive within about six months, I will ask them to consider assisted conception because after um, six months of trying, the chances of the adenomyosis recurring is very high. And if they do not get pregnant within that six months, I would say that we must start thinking about doing assisted reproductive techniques. This is an example of a patient before HIFU. She has a large ad anterior adenomyosis and we have done the ablation. This, this is the MRI one day after HIFU. And this is the MRI three months after HIFU. The uterus has already shrunk. And uh, the shrinkage was 55%. Before HIFU, it was 396 centimeter cube. Three months later, it's 178 centimeter cube. And I've asked her to go and try to conceive spontaneously. And if she doesn't conceive, then we have to start, start thinking of uh, IVF for these patients. So in conclusion, adenomyosis is a very difficult problem. It is more difficult when the patient wants to conceive. Studies have shown that success rate in reducing menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea is up to 85%. Not all adenomyosis scales are the same. In some, ablation is easy. In others, it can be difficult. In women with adenomyosis who have difficulty in conceiving, especially after failed IVF, HIFU is a good option to shrink the adenomyosis before frozen embryo transfer. There are many challenges in performing HIFU for these patients, including how much to ablate and how to avoid the endometrium. As I told you all, if the adenomyosis have already reached the endometrial cavity, sometimes very difficult to prevent the heat from reaching the endometrial cavity. The next difficulty is to decide when is the best time to do a frozen embryo transfer. My suggestion is at three months post HIFU. We also can use CA125 to determine when is the best time to do the embryo transfer. If the CA125 is still above 35, then we can give generation lock until it's below 35 and then perform the embryo transfer. HIFU can also be done patients who have adenomyosis who want to conceive spontaneously, but she must be prepared to repeat the HIFU treatment if she did not conceive and the adenomyosis recurs. As I told you all, in adenomyosis patients, we cannot ablate 100% of the lesion. There's still some adenomyosis left and it will recur. So if they don't get pregnant, we have to either go and do IVF or repeat the HIFU if the disease recurs. So in this kind of patients, they should consider to have IVF early. Thank you.